So, Professor Conyers, we're we're back on Blyden. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, now we were, here's the thing. He he's he's known as a as a progenitor or father of, of Pan African, if you will. He's born in the um, the what the nineteenth century, nineteenth century, or mid eighteen hundred, or eighteen thirty, whatever, whatever it was. Um, and he, I mean, he's known as the guy, but the, the the guy that really pushes this beyond anybody's expectation is um, is Marcus Garvey. Now, when I say that, only because so he's the person that has the name of of Pan Africanism, uh, somehow advanced it. But Blind is sort of like the, the the beginning of it. So, what was that beginning like? And remember now, now let me go back. Now he's in. Let me go back. What's what was the beginning of that Pan African idea? With Pan Africanism um, idea? With, 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 with you mean with Blind? Yeah, with Blind. Yes, with Blind. Well, well, again, I think I mentioned last time that. Uh, Blyden came to the United States in 1850 to further his education. And we did that yeah, yeah. whole story the last time to further his education. While he was here, he was fe fearful of being captured as a runaway slave, even though he was free, because in 1850 yeah. they passed the Fugitive. Federal Fugitive Slave Act. Yeah. And so what happened was he heard about a newly independent state in Africa, the state Liberia, and with some friends from the American Colonization Society, he was able to go to Liberia uh, and to further his education. So while he was in Liberia, uh, let, let's just go back a second. He went to Liberia the way many Western education, educated Africans might have mm -hmm. gone to Liberia. He went to Liberia with the idea of education, educating and Christianizing his Christian heathen ministry. brothers. That's, that was the yeah. big thing, yeah. But while he was there, as a result of his great uh, capacity for observation and for learning, he rapidly began to change. He began to have an appreciation for African systems, Afri African systems of religion, African systems of government. And he gradually began to change and he began doing studies uh, on Africa, began to go into the interior of Liberia and later on Sierra Leone to study mm -hmm. African people and grew in appreciation. He began to realize the way many of us do mm -hmm. that uh, contrary to what he had been taught, African people were not a primitive backward people that they were among the most enlightened people. They had systems of government and systems of religion, systems of education that rivaled anybody in the world. And from that point of view, he began to study and develop and grow in his appreciation for things African. So for him, that was the beginning of it. Okay, for him later. Now remember where we are geographically, I guess we say Liberia is, uh, I guess they're right tucked under, <laughs> under it's ba basically, I, I want to say Northwest uh, uh, Africa, but that's not really right. Well, it's true. right next to Sierra Leone. Sure, you know. I guess that's the landmark for most people who would mm -hmm. be uh, looking at this video to uh, understand where Liberia is. But now, so, so being in Liberia, what I'm trying to say, if you located on ge ge geographically where we are, then how does he get all that information about the, the darkest regions of Africa and all the rest of that stuff? Well, and again, how, Blyden, how Blyden wasn't just stationary in Liberia himself. He traveled mm -hmm. around. As I mentioned a minute ago. Okay, when you say around, what, do you, what does Well, it I mean, mean, he went into the interior of Liberia and Sierra Leone, studying the people there, had an mm -hmm. appreciation for the setup and organization of their villages and their towns. And later on, he traveled to other places. Blyden, uh, at, at least later in his career, was the best known African in the world. So he traveled mm -hmm. to England. He went to Sweden. He went all over the place. He mm -hmm. came to America at least six times. And so mm -hmm. he was well known. He was even friends with Charles Dickens. Hmm. So he traveled around a lot. He had a chance to learn, and he studied. Yeah, this was a master yeah. scholar. Yeah, but that's what I'm trying to say. With yeah. this information, I mean, I, I want to say a library of Timbuktu. That's pretty close to, to, no. to, to, to whatever. But I'm just saying, where, 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 was he getting his stuff from Europeans? Was he, he was getting, getting, where, he was was getting it, his where, information from the books that he came in contact with, yeah. which came from all over the known world, okay. from America, from Europe, England, and other places. So. Uh, again, he began reading books, studying, and he began with his own keen observation, putting together that yeah. what he had been taught about African people clearly wasn't true. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, so um, so so now we're we're let's 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 be full on Blyden here. So let's say Blyden has everything. Now, well, you know, he has um, everything. Together, you know, in other words, he, he knows what he's talking about. Now he's really going to start um, going around. Pre is he preaching Pan Africanism? Or what what's he preaching? How is this coming out? It's, it's not called Pan Africanism. Then what's what's happening? Well, he, again, he what he's doing is developing, mm -hmm. and in the developing, he's also teaching. 
one of his first projects, of course, was uh, Liberia College, getting Liberia College off the off the ground in 1860, 1861, getting Liberia College off the ground. And the purpose of Liberia College, as Blyden saw it, mm -hmm. was to have a place where Africans, not only in Liberia, Sierra, Sierra Leone, but Africans from all over the then world could come back to Africa and get an African education. Now, he wasn't using words like Afrocentric that's or right, African-centered, yeah, yeah, yeah. but he developed an educational program, which he called later, uh, he called it as president of Liberia College in 1881. He called it uh, a liberal education. A liberal education to Blyden simply mm -hmm. means studying all of the arts and sciences, mm -hmm. but basically, by and large, not neglecting African history and African culture. So putting it within the context of that which is relevant to African people, history mm -hmm. and culture, not losing sight of that, mm -hmm. but at the same time, studying the disciplines, as he put it, that would hone or educate the mind or sharpen the mind for its greater duty for mm -hmm. African people. Mm -hmm. Liberia and Blind's mind, and I guess this is what Garvey would later, why Garvey would later gravitate to it, Liberia would be the foundation, the home of a, I guess you might say, developing African empire, where African people from all over the world could be proud of the accomplishments of African people in Liberia, the accomplishments of being independent uh, politically as well as economically, scientifically, and every other type of way. So the basic idea that Blyden had of Pan-Africanism, even though he didn't use the word, was exactly to some degree what Marcus Coffey thought about in terms of developing a home base for African people to develop this empire that was spread throughout Africa and joined all African people together with a particular type of education, which once again, as he was, as he used to say, bring the half African home to himself. Ah, good phrase. Bring the African home to himself. Um, so let's move on from there. Just, just, just because we have to. When I say we have to. I mean, I'm still. Uh, again, people may or may not know Blind's name. Everybody sort of knows Marcus Garvey's name, but if something like Marcus Garvey sort of is on one track, is Blind on another track? I mean, how do how do we put these two? I don't say philosophies, but these two tracks together. I'm not sure what you mean do, by do they, tracks. I would say two different time periods. Okay, time. Period. All right, and what I mean by that, Blind was born in the early part of the 19th century. He was born in 1882. Garvey was born in 1887. And so Blyden had almost the entirety of the 19th century in a small well, portion. Was born 18, 18, was it Blyden? Blyden was born in 1832. 1832, yeah. That's yeah, right. and Garvey was born yeah, in 1887. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Blyden had almost the entirety of the 19th century to develop and to grow. And keeping okay. in mind okay. that Blyden, by and large, when you look at the population of African people, not only in Africa, throughout the world, because mm -hmm. uh, slavery is raging here in the United States and every place else, Blyden was one of the few blacks in comparison to the total number of African people mm -hmm. uh, outside of Africa or even inside of Africa who was well educated. Mm -hmm. And thus, <clears throat> you know, he had a time to formulate his ideas and develop and to grow over a course of time. The difference between what you call the tracks of Garvey and the track of Blyden is simply that in time where uh, Blyden had to grapple virtually single-handedly uh, okay, with good. the issues of the African world in the 19th century. Now, don't get me wrong, there were other people, both in America and other places, who were also doing the same thing. You had Henry Bibb, you had Martin Delaney, you had Alexander Crummel, who would join Blyden in Liberia and uh, begin to work okay, on behalf. That's what I need, hold on, the Crummel, the Crummel right. guy. See, because I'm, I'm thinking, I'm actually thinking about us, even. If, right. <laughs> sometimes I'm talking to you, and right. I, you know, I'm, get, I'm getting a whole lot of, information, you know, and you're talking to me, and you spur me on whatever have you. Well, I, in other words, I need you to talk to. I don't know if you need me so much, but right. whatever. But the point is, who was Blyden talking to? You know what I mean? Who was he, who was he, I don't know, not sparring with, but who was he bouncing his eyes or ideas off of? Who was saying, nah, that don't sound right, whatever have you. Right. Blyden was bouncing his ideas off uh, other educated blacks that came from the United States, those who might have been in Africa, like Crummel and other people. That's one group. Well, let me just finish. That's mm -hmm. one group of people. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, Blyden was trying to develop an educational system where he can bounce his ideas off indigenous Africans throughout the continent, especially in Liberia and Sierra Leone. This was the purpose of Liberia College, mm -hmm. to educate the African, as I said earlier, to bring the African home to himself. Mm -hmm. The problem with Blyden's ideas in Liberia was that the elite population of Liberia, and I mentioned mm -hmm. this the last time, were mostly mulattoes, quadroons, and octoroons, who 
although they came to Liberia, were bringing with them the racial schematic of the American racial system to Liberia. And in essence, what they did was set up that same schematic in Liberia and to a large degree refused to allow the indigenous blacks, the indigenous Africans to participate Mm. in the well-being of the nation by not allowing them or preventing them from going to Liberia College, getting education and so on. And this created major problems for Blyden because he had to bump heads with them. I mentioned the last time that something like the first four or five presidents Mm. of Liberia were indistinguishable from white people. J.J. Roberts being the first. And so Blyden had a lot of problems with them transplanting the racial scheme added to Liberia with themselves, in essence, taking the place of white people in the Liberian scenario. And so, again, Blyden met major opposition to all of his ideas because he had to go through this class of people who were not very receptive to it. In fact, Blyden writes continually in his letters to one of his friends in America, William Coppinger, who's the secretary of the American Colonization Society, not only about the problem of the mulattoes, but the problem of his mm-hmm. wife, who was a mulatto. Mm-hmm. And he writes that she's, you know, she's creating any number of problems for him mm-hmm. uh, because he did not, she did not understand. And she always sided with the mulatto mm-hmm. class against people of Africa, against black people in Liberia. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, some I actually want to end there. When I okay. say end there, I don't, I don't really want to, but I want to, but I, I want to. I want to pivot just a little bit. Okay. There, there is a question, maybe not now, but sometimes we have to deal with this question because I noticed it all over the place. F- to govern is basically to manage. You know, so you have to have a whole managerial right. scheme of things. And what what the, um, the colonialists did and a bunch of other people have done, they've always uh, it happened in Haiti. It, it happened with apartheid. What happened is they create this buffer class. Right. And usually the buffer class or we call them colored people, you know, you know, we call them the boule, but you know, right. light, the high yellow light, whatever the heck they, they call it. But more importantly, their experience is not with the masses of the people. They, they've created their own little class and then their class constantly aspiring to be the rulers. And I, and I just see this time and time and time and time again. So we have to deal with that. Are you saying that's what Blyden was actually dealing with? He was dealing with that. In any scenario where you have a a standard or a schematic where being white more or less is being right. Being white is the standard of power. Being right is the standard of being good. Being right is the standard of of righteousness. Hmm. Uh, Anytime you have a scenario like that and black is the worst possible thing that you can be. Black is on the bottom. Black is all of the negative Hmm. things that you can be. Any group of people who are standing in between that, especially groups of people who are mulatto, quadroons, and octoroons who have white relatives and who get not only intellectual and psychological uh, a state of well-being from being part white, but also get a certain level of privilege from being part white because they can possibly do things that black people can't do, yeah. are going to gravitate towards that. Even in today's society, we have groups of people that don't even have to be black. Mm. who occupy a very similar position right. here in the United States. And when black people try to do something, quite often, directly or indirectly, they block us. Yep. You know, because they are also gravitating, as well as many of us are gravitating to the idea of being white as being better. Mm. And so as long as that's in place, which, mm. which is what we call white supremacy, mm. then you're going to have this group of people that always put, put uh uh, present obstacles for us. And Blyden had to face that. Remember, the entire elite class in Liberia, by and large, were these people mm. uh, who were mulattoes, quadroons, and octoroons who controlled everything. And in fact, they didn't even want Liberia to be independent from the United States. They wanted to be a part of the European United States world. What they did in Liberia, rather than develop their own economy, to grow their own food, as Blyden wanted them to do, what they did was to import everything, all of their foodstuffs and their clothing, they po- imported it from the United States and Europe. Mm-hmm. They wanted to be Europeans mm-hmm. in Africa, in essence, mm-hmm. where they could play out those roles among themselves there, which they couldn't do in the United States. Well, what has changed? Not very much. I mean, in, in terms of the ideology of it and the philosophy of it. 
You know, there are some things that have changed in the United States where, you know, now we're talking about biracial and this kind of racial and so on. Right? You know, and this has become more or less an acceptable thing. But the process in terms of the worldview and ideology still provides a buffer group that stands in between us and them on many, many respects. I mean, mm. and uh, much of what we see in terms of the racial schematic is still in place. White supremacy, racism in the form of white supremacy is as prevalent now as it always has been, except that the average black person and maybe the average person in general does not know what white supremacy is, does not know how it operates, and very few people are able to recognize it. Most people, especially black people, but most people think that just simply having prejudice is racism. Yeah, that yeah. is not racism. And so we get into confusion and generally the worldview and ideology of many black people who have been enculturated in the Western world and have been taught to think, speak and act in terms of Western paradigms quite often themselves provide a buffer group between oh boy. black consciousness, mm. yeah. black liberation uh, and white people. Like I said, Chimaranga should be in effect. We got to get rid. No, let me stop. Let me just stop that. This is your interview. Uh, that, look, let, 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 let's let's just stop it. But let me before we really end. Uh, what what what's the essential uh, Biden? Uh, Biden, <laughs> Biden. Uh, when I say essential Biden, I mean from his writings and other people's writings. Who what would you uh, say? people should be looking at if they want to know a little bit more about Blyden. Well, there are a couple of biographies on Blyden that are, that are very good. Uh, I disagree with some of the premises that are put forth in, in these biographies, but they're very, very good. There's a biography by, and in fact, I would say the essential biography is by uh, Dr. Hollis Lynch called Pan-Negro Patriot. And I would suggest that everybody pick up that book and read it there. Uh, mm -hmm. People can look around for some of the articles that I've written. Uh, there's one article where I do a synopsis of Blyden in the... Uh, the Encyclopedia of African Cultural Heritage in North America, uh, edited by Mwali Musuja. I have a piece in there on Blyden that just looks at a sweep uh, of Blyden. Uh, there's also a well, when, when did that come out? Uh, I don't know. I think it's about seven years ago, eight okay. years ago. Okay. But I have a piece in there. And I have pieces in a variety of other journals. And then there was another book. Actually, it was a dissertation by, I can't remember his first name. I think it was Thomas Livingston. He wrote a book on Blyden. There's also a couple pieces by... Cecil Blake, and any number of scholars that have written articles on different aspects of Blydenic philosophy. So there's a lot of work out there on Blyden. Blyden, uh, once again, and I'm going to go back to what Dr. Clark used to say, uh, Blyden was so far ahead of his time that he probably is ahead of our time in terms of mm. understanding of where we need to go, where we need to be, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, many people may have heard the name Blyden by and large, but to a large degree, the name Edward Wilmot Blyden has been whited out of history for the most part. And this is why he gets overshadowed by so many other people, because he was little understood during his day. And in fact, uh, toward the latter part of his life, he died in, uh, at 80 years old in 1912. Uh, you know, everybody had forgotten about him. He died in poverty by and large. Even his pension had been taken away from him. And he was living by and large from hand to mouth. Mm. Up until the day of his death, but up until the day of his death, he was still, uh, as uh, as we would say, a Pan-African patriot mm. right up until the end. Mm. He was just disappointed, in my opinion, he was just disappointed about the direction that the people of Liberia and the people of Sierra Leone had taken in terms of what he hoped those two nations could be and where they should go. Mm. Okay, well, Dr. James Conyers, thank you for so much for uh, having this little, you know, uh, I'm not talking. I'm just listening. <laughs> Let me listen. Right. Listen to you. Um, I guess I would be, be uh, remiss. Is there any way people can you did not necessarily get in touch with you, but get in touch with you or find out your writings or whatever it is? Well, I mean, they just have to look around. I mean, they can get in touch with me. I, I don't want a whole bunch of people. No, no, no. Yeah. That's right. right. Just, just, I, they, I mentioned they, if they look in the 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 uh, again the Encyclopedia of African Cultural Heritage in North America, mm -hmm. they'll see in the bibliography about three or four of my writings on Blyden. From there, it'll take them other places. But well, we're the age of the internet. They just look up uh, C O N Y E R. Yeah, but there are two James Conyers. This is my oh, classmate, James Marvier Conyers, who God. is a much more prolific writer than than me. He's you know has journals and whatnot. And then there's me. You know, and so what? What's your James? I'm James E. He's James, James L. 
Okay, James. Right, okay. but that's my good brother, man. That's my good friend, and we both share the name. And I've, in fact, I would suggest that people look in his work because I have an article about Blyden and his work. Mm, okay. So if they look up James, uh, you know, James L. Conyers and his work, you'll find an article by James E. Conyers because we were classmates at Temple University at exactly the same time in exactly the same program. Yeah, causing havoc, I suppose, right. in whatever department you're always messing around in. Okay. Right. <laughs> Right. But I just want to mention, you know, finally, I mean, all of this has been made possible in terms of what we've been able to do. And I just me in a limited fashion, because I've had so many obstacles in life where I haven't been able to do as much as I'd like to. But I just want to give a shout out, you know, to Malefi K. Asante and uh, certainly Marimba Ani and Dr. James Turner. These are all influences in my life. And first and foremost, Dr. John Henry Clark, uh, you know, so that these are people that have influenced all of my thinking. And everything that I do along with my own personal studies. But these are the instrumental people. And there are many, many more. Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinin, but many, many more. But these are people, especially Marimba Ani and uh, certainly uh, Dr. John Henry Clark, uh, are, are special people in my life. And in fact, my life would have taken a different turn had I not come across these people, like I would dare say, at crucial points in life, which helped change my trajectory, my, you know, my way of life, uh, my way I was going. Uh. Let's let's leave it there because you know that goes back to our whole theory. Our, yeah. Can we say our theory where the where where the universe we keep on people keep on colliding with each other. Every time you collide with somebody, which collide is a bad word. Every time you you touch somebody, you take some of them with you, but also they take some of you with you, and somehow that's how things go. Well, I would say we learn from one another. We we pick up pieces from one another. We pick up pieces. We get influence. We pass that influence on. I mean, there used to be somebody in New York here way back when, back in the nineteen sixties and before. Uh, sister radio talk show host and her name was Alma John and what yeah, she said was Alma John sure radio yeah what she said oh. was each one teach one mm, yeah, yeah. you know and we've all practiced that I mean you know again all of the people that I just named uh, have been influences in my life major influences mm. in, in my life and you know uh, you know no matter what we do and we're all in this no matter how high we are or how low we are we all have a place in this struggle and we all teach somebody. Mm -hmm. We all, you know, uh, um, uh, give out information to people. I try to do it wherever I'm at mm -hmm. and do my little contribution in my own little way. I'm not out there for, you know, uh, advancing my ego or anything like that. I just simply uh, am, you know, uh, you know, a Pan-African nationalist. And that's mm -hmm. simply it. I believe in African people and I do not compromise when it comes to being African. When it comes to people asking me who, who I am, I am African. There's no debate. There's no negotiation. There's no compromise on that. We don't get debate the debate whether or not I'm African. Mm -hmm. We don't get to debate whether or not we're African. Mm -hmm. All right. There is no negotiation, no debate on those issues. People can call themselves whatever they want. But when it comes to James Conyers, I am an African. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.